Okay, so hello. Um, today we're here to talk about how to create complex field widgets on Drupal. Um, I'm pretty happy to be here. I'm pretty happy um, to have all these people here too. Um, this is my first time talking in the bathroom, like in sessions. So I, I'm pretty excited about all this. Um, so thanks for coming. Welcome. Um, this is a link to the slides. You can see it in the top, in the bottom right. Um, it is going to be there for around three slides, but if you can get it, I'm going to put it in the chat at the end of the talk. Um, but yeah, welcome. So who am I? Hi, my name is Darisa Spinach. Um, you can find me at like Darisa in almost everywhere. <laughs> um, I am from Costa Rica. I live in the Pacific coast. I live like one block away from the beach, but I never go, but I love it. And I have almost a zoo in my house. So many dogs and cats. And you'll see here, my friend is gone. Um, he usually comes in when I'm talking and start biting my headphones. So if you see that, it, it you know, <laughs> it, it is that we can't do anything. So yeah. Okay. I'm a Drupal developer. Um, I work as a Drupal backend developer in Estudio Manati, which is a Costa Rican company. And we are an agile full service web agency with a human first collaborative approach in design and excellence in delivery. We are a group of passionate people with, who wants to make the web a better place. And um, we, we're really focused on humans and experiences and that's what we love to do. I've been working with Drupal for about, I think almost six years now. And a lot of that time has been working with Deegan Deacon is a community-driven, free, and open-source open data platform that gives organizations and individuals ultimate freedom to publish and consume structured information. So why I'm talking about Deacon? Well, a part of it being a big part of what I do. Um, also, this stuff comes from that. It, it was a problem that we were facing um, in the Deacon new version. And we found out that the best way to achieve it and, and to solve the problem was actually creating a custom widget. Um, so this is what this, th that is where this comes from. So what are we going to cover today? First, um, just for setting the base, we're going to talk about things we need to know before starting to create widgets, which are fields in Drupal, render arrays, and annotations. Then we will go full hands-on on custom widgets. Where are they? When do we need them? Um, when do, when we don't need them. <laughs> and then I'm going to tell you the story of the problem we we're having and how we solved it. Um, so let's go. First, um, I, I assume some of you already know some of this stuff, so I will try to cover it quickly. Um, but yeah, I, I believe it is, it is good to have like a common base, just in case. So things we need to know, fields. Um, I know we've all, everybody that works with Drupal have interacted with fields. So they are um, individual components that make every content type in Drupal unique, right? So for example, in, 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 most, in all the content types, we have the body field and a title field, and we can add as many fields as we want. We can have an address, an email, and phone fields. We can have tags, we can have anything, right? And all this stuff, is basically powered by a big part of Drupal, which is the field API. This field API is what is in charge of defining all these components um, of Drupal. The field API is made of three main components, which are the field types, field widgets, and the field formatters. Um, so at the beginning, it's a little bit hard to find the difference, but in, in practice, it is just like the field types is what allows us to define the type of data that is going to be stored. So that way we can say, okay, this is going to be a string. This is going to be a number. This is going to be an entity reference. This is going to be a date and like that. The field widget is actually how the field is going to be rendered in the form, right? So how is it that the user is going to interact with Drupal to be able to save something in the database? And then the field formatter, which is how the field is actually rendered for the final user. So 
Um, we did some formarios at the beginning, even for me, it was a little bit weird. I, I didn't understand, but it is basically that. Widgets is for forms, formar is for the final presentation of the items. So for example, in the case of the tags, um, which we can see in the screenshot, um, we have an autocomplete filter for adding tags in there. And then um, we have the formar, which is how we are going to present it. So for example, with the tags, we have different ways of showing rendered entities. Um, we can show it as plain text, we can show it as links, um, and those are for manners. Um, so the main thing here is that the three items that we're talking about, they're all plugins. And for defining each of them, we need to create a class. Each of these classes is going to have annotations, which is what helps Drupal discover the plugins. And also um, these classes should return a render array in order to render the item as is. So this is why we're gonna cover these two items. So first, render arrays. Um, what are they? They are basically the building blocks of every single Drupal page, okay? They give us information about the data that we want to present and how we shall present it. They give us hints about that. So um, to, in order for Drupal to be able to know how it's going to be the rendering, we need to give them these kind of arrays. So this rendering basically means how are we going to transform from arrays to HTML markup? So how does a render array look like? It'll be something like this. Um, we simply have an array, which is an associative thing with keys and values. And here we can see the content or the data and the properties. So the, the content can be there as nested arrays and the properties is the, are those elements which has the hashtag at the beginning. And that is what tells Drupal or what gives, what gives Drupal the hints about how this content shall be displayed. So that's it. There is a lot, a lot more to say about render arrays, but um, you can look at it in a Drupal documentation. And this is like the basis. So the annotations, um, every class, every, every plugin class shall have an annotation and these annotations are basically used for registering plugin and describing the metadata of those plugins. So they're basically a structured comments which give information about the class that we are creating. So this is how an annotation will look like. You can see um, the first element is actually just a comment, like the description of the plugin we are creating and the actual um, annotation starts like in line fourth, I think. Uh, when we see at fill widget. So usually we have at and the type of the plugin. And in this case, this will be a fill widget. Um, I took this example for from the Boolean checkbox widget, which is in core. And yeah, basically it has some keys and some values. The annotation sy syntax is using doctrine, but even then we have to follow some Drupal standards. So for example, at the end of each value, we need to have a new line and when we have arrays, we need to keep adding the trailing commas at the end and that kind of stuff. But it is basically um, doctrine. We'll go deeper in the description of the field widget later on. Also, if you have any question, um, you can type it in the chat and, and I can answer. Um, so yeah, now that we have talked about all these three things, we can go deeper into custom widgets. We know that a lot of things in Drupal are made via the UI, but sometimes what Drupal gives us is not enough. So it is then when we have to try to see if we should create something custom. In this case, we're talking about custom widgets. They are, of course, created in code. Um, and it is interesting because they can be a combination of other existing arrays, I mean, existing widgets that we have, but with some extra functionality or maybe they, they are written from scratch because what we have is not enough for us and we need to do something completely different. Or maybe it is a mixture of both and we are going to extend an existing widget to add more stuff in it. So custom widgets are, are per, very powerful and we can create a lot of stuff with them, though not always <laughs> are needed. Um, we, we don't always need to do this. For example, if what we want to do is just display the 
uh, alter the display of an element, then probably we, we don't need to do this. Like if we want to change a label or something like that, we can just use a form alter. If we need to add extra submit functions um, to our forms, we don't need to do a custom widget for that. We can do it in a form alter. Same with adding extra validation functions or even showing fields conditionally. Not, not necessarily we want, we need to create a full custom widget to do it. In, the, in that case, um, we could do states API or something. So this takes us to when do we need to do this? Okay. Um, basically, it, this is a good question because Drupal provides a lot of widgets and it is pretty hard to find them all out. So um, the thing is, Drupal has a lot of things, but sometimes that is not enough. So we will need to take it, take a breath, and try to find out what do we need. So I'd say that in order to create a custom widget, we should figure out what is it um, that our necessity is. For example, I think that storing data in that specific way and make it easy to use and not our prone to users, that specific thing may be something we can do with form up, with, with custom widgets. So for example, the classic example of how to do a custom widget will be like the color picker widget. Um, so why is that a good example? Because we need to save the thing, for example, in a, an hexadecimal code, but we need the user to put something valid there. So it is easier to have a color picker and then save the value as the hexadecimal code, and that's it. Um, another example is um, actually something we, we, we had in Deacon. Um, for example, we have some field that we need to save as an a URL, but we also need the user to be able to upload a file or a link to an external file. We don't have a widget in Drupal that allows us to do that. Um, we have something that allows us to add an URL and we have something that allows us to put a file upload, but not something that allows the user to choose one of the two and save it in the same field. So that's a good example of when a custom widget can be done. Um, other option is what we're going to do here, which is like having multiple fields inside of another field. Um, we're, going, we're going to go into this um, really soon. So how do we know that what I need to do is not in Drupal? Okay, there are so many widgets in Drupal and sometimes it is hard to find existing widgets. I would recommend first checking um, the core and the country module have, you have installed. And in order to do this, you can first check Drupal console. Um, with Drupal console, you can just run one command and it will return all the plugins that are filled widgets in your current installation, including the, all the control models you have or just the core and, and, and the core, I mean. So um, it is fairly easy to, to know it and you can test and you can see um, if, if something about that works. The, the module, I mean, the, the command will give you the plugin ID and the plugin class so you can go deeper into the code and find out uh, what you need. Even this will help you, this will help you to find out if you need to do some more customizations on the top of one of the existing widgets. And that's pretty cool and it is doable. So um, there's that. So what was the problem we had in, in Deacon? Basically we have one, we have one content type, which is called data. And this content type has just one single field, which is called JSON metadata. Um, we did this because um, we are focusing the schemas. We're schema first. This is a schema centered platform now. And we don't want the users to have to come to the field UI and change the different fields and export all the configuration and everything. So the developers or the people who, who is in charge of the data um, can just come to the schema and update the thing. And then we just save it in one single field. Um, it is pretty easy to do and easy to handle most now that we are API first, but it is a problem for the users because imagine a user coming here to change the title of the data <laughs> or changing the, the modified date or, or the temporal date, or the name of a distribution. I don't know. 
it, it will be hard for them. They will need to know JSON in order to do that. So we started using a library called React Using Schema Form, which did basically what we needed, which was actually be the, build a form based on a, on a JSON schema. It was pretty cool, but it will still give us some problems. So one of them was we had to build a different UI. So it was not so intuitive for users to go there <laughs> and do the things that they needed to do. And the other thing is we needed more powerful features like the date picker, the, that library didn't have that. Or, or the other element I just told you about, the one with the file upload and the, in the, and the URL field and save all in the same URL. So um, that kind of stuff was being super difficult to do. And we said, well, Drupal has the Form API and it has a lot of stuff there and it is actually pretty cool and pretty stable and pretty maintained. So why don't we go back to Drupal? And that's what we did. So our solution was to create this JSON form widget. So how do we do this? <clears throat> Basically, we need to take five things into, into account, which are where is the class going to be located? Where is the namespace it should has? Well, where it should live? The annotation, the actual class, and the settings. So for the location, it is pretty easy. Um, we need to put it under the name of our slash src, slash plugin, slash field, slash field widget. And inside of that, we should place our, our class. So in our case, um, the class was called JSON farm widget. And that's the, the location we, we put it under JSON farm widget and all the same items as, as we have it in the top of the of the page here. I, I mean, sorry. And, and that was it. So what was next? Defining the namespace. The namespace is actually where the class lives. So again, it follows the same convention almost. Um, in our case, we just had to change the module name to JSON from widget and that's it a recipe. And what about the annotation for creating field widgets? We need the annotation to be something specific. There are three things that are required in order to have an annotation for a field widget and having Drupal be able to discover the plugin correctly. And those three things are the ID, which is basically the machine name, let's say, of the widget that we're going to have. Then the label, which is the human name of the element and the field types that this widget supports. So this basically means that if we have a field that is of type string long, we could use this widget, which is exactly what we needed. Um, so once we're in this point, we have the class available, right? The class need to implement the widget interface which is like the interface Drupal has for this kind of stuff, but also Drupal give us the widget base class, which is a base thing that already has a lot of things set up and we can just extend from that and override what we need. So in order to create our widget, we just need to have the form element. Um, the form element is, is the required thing and it is also where the magic happens. <laughs> it is via render arrays, you can add here whatever you want and build a farm. So um, basically this is how it will look like. And instead of this bit is where you will get as um, creative as you want. So you just need to build the render array and return it here. For example, um, the string text field widget only has one element and this is the basic thing, right? So this looks like this, and that's it. But we can also have multiple elements inside of our render array. So we could have this text field, and then also another thing, which is going to be um, a file file upload, and then another thing that is going to be a date picker. And then we will need to process all that to become one single thing that is the thing that we're storing. Um, so we're going to look at this pretty soon, I promise. In order to have the settings form, this is a
an extra setting, which was the schema. Because we want the users um, to be able to define what is the schema that is going to be used to build the thing. So for example, we used to have a schema for a JSON schema for data sets and another JSON schema for publishers. And at the end, the content type is almost the same. It, it just has one string long field that has JSON metadata in it. But it's actually different because the data set should have some fields and the publisher should have other fields. But depending on the open data schema, where, um, they will be different. So this is what we we're accounting for. And what do we need to do? There are three things. First, we need this to, we need to set the default values for the schema, then actually create the config schema, and finally add the form. So for setting default values, it is just a matter of using implementing actually the default settings um, method. And here we just need to return the name of the properties or the configurations we need to have. In my case, it was just something called schema. And also return this thing with the parent default settings. Why is this? Just because if you are um, extending another, another widget that has already some settings and you need to append all our settings, then this is the best way to have both things there and not miss what, what the parent class gives you. So that's one thing. Um, after doing this, we need to create a config schema. And this config schema is basically a file inside of the folder config, inside of the um, inside of that have a, a folder called schema, and in there the file. Um, so this is what the content of my file was. It just needed to be field widget settings and the name of the module to say it is that. And then I'm up in for the schema we were creating. Once we have this, we need to actually add the form. And again, this is just a matter of um, implementing the settings form uh, method. And in here, we just need to add, again, a render array displaying, um, giving Drupal the hints about what it needs to display. So in this case, um, my schema field in the settings form for this widget is going to be just a text field where people is going to put the name of the schema. In my case, um, we already have the schemas defined somewhere else. And so I just needed the people to put their, the name of the schema that we are going to retrieve and using a service we're retrieving that. But if you want to do something like this, like you could put there a string long again and have a text area and put the whole schema inside of that. That, that could work too. Um, or get creative, it's fine. Um, so yeah, this is, this is what we did. And at this point, um, when you go to the manage form display for the data set, I mean, for the content type, you want to apply this to, um, this is what you will see. Now you have the widget um, settings form and the field for the configuration. So people should put here whatever schema name it is and we will retrieve that schema and build a form based on it. So, yeah. What happens if you close um, the element? If, if you just put the name there and click on update, you wouldn't see what you put in there. So there is an extra thing, which is adding the settings summary. If you want to have a setting summary, you just need to um, implement the setting summary method which again is just a render, array, a render array, which has the name of what you need to, which has the data that you want to display. So this is how it will look like once you close it. Now it has um, the, the summary here because the user put in data set. So that's what we see now. So for now, this has been like simple things. And in order to make it complex, we need to be creative. But basically what we need to do is alter all we want in a form element and 
build a, a render array with all the elements we want. And then um, this is the tricky part because probably creating the render array for the form element is is not so hard depending on what we need. But then if, as in our case, you are you need to put there a lot of fields and then save it in just one single thing, um, you need to do some handling of the data. And this handling of the data needs to be done using the implementing the method extract form values. This function allows you to take the values from the submitted data, process all that thing, put it as you need, and then um, Drupal will know what to do with that. That, that is the actual value of the field you're putting. So in our case, we wanted to show a full form with a lot of fields and have the users be able to put every single thing in there. Once they click on submit, it should all be saved in just one field, which was the JSON metadata. So let's see it. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second to change um, to change what I'm presenting and okay. I think you can see my screen now. So basically this is what we have. This is where we will change the thing and this is the code. Okay, so this is code. Um, here, you can see um, the location of the things. I'm gonna post this a little bit. You can see this is where our schema was um, created. And this is where all the magic happens. So we have the namespace defined as I told you before. We have the annotation here. Um, so as you saw, we have the three required elements, which are ID, label, and field types, and we're extending the widget base. Um, in our case, it is like this because we needed to have a completely different thing. So um, I am doing dependency injections because I needed to have another service that we are using, and just that. You can see here the default settings thing being implemented and the settings form and the settings summary and all that it does is for us to be able to come here, look at this JSON metadata, which is a string long thing and make it be a JSON form. So if we do this, we need to change the actual um, schema. In my case, I'm gonna put here data set I'm gonna update that and I'm gonna save it. So when it was the other widget, this is how the form looked like. I'm sorry, I haven't updated my Drupal site. This is a bad practice, please update your sites. Um, but yeah, okay, so once it is saved, if we reload this page, we're going to see we have the full form. So this is quite easier for users to be able to come here and update each of the things we have. So how did I did this? Basically, I just used the form element function. In this function, what I'm doing is bringing the um, default values of, of what is, like bringing the values of the node, what is already saved in case there is something saved. Um, if it is new, of course, it'll be an empty array, this default data. But basically, I just called a function called get JSON form with all the information I needed to build the form with. So this get JSON form is what actually <laughs> does my magic. Um, so here I am basically just retrieving the schema in order to um, build the form. And once I get the schema, I am iterating over the properties it has. So I'm just gonna show the schema real quick. Well, this is a big schema. It, it has a lot of fields. So for example, 
Um, it has all these properties. It has a property called type, title, identifier, and you can see here that we have information about what those fields should be. Okay. Remember that the JSON schemas, what, what they do is actually help us validate JSON. So um, if we're already validating the netgain stat, we are now trying to also build a form based on it. So here, what I'm doing is actually iterating over those properties and getting the form element necessary for each of them. So the form, the get form element, these, these other functions are private because they're not really used anywhere else. Um, but it is what we have right now. So this get form element actually takes in the type of the property we were looking at. So for example, for type, the type is a strong. For title, uh, the type is also string. The, for identifier, it's also string. But for example, for, for the field, um, let me find it. For the field publisher, it is actually an object. So the, the main elements we have in this schema are objects, arrays, and strings. So I just got different um, functions for each of these type of items. So it can actually print or, or specify, establish what is the render array for, for them. In this case, um, the handle string element, what it does is basically set an element that is going to be of type text field. So the widget that, is, that it is using is a text field, but then we had a lot of a lot of stuff in based on the other properties of the element. So if the property has a title, then we append a title to the element. If it has a description, we append a description. And that's how we, we are doing the things. For example, if you see this element here, the frequency, it is a string, but it has a property called enum, enum. So what I do is if it has this property, then we convert the item to be a select list. And that's how this is all being handled. Um, just doing a lot of conditionals, checking what is um, that we need to print. And this not only works with this schema, it should be able to work with other schemas as well. In our case, this is, these are like the three items that we always have, like object, arrays, and strings. But if we are going to build something and that has different types, and we can also add it here, um, I think it's fairly easy. Um, so the handling of everything is complex. For example, how we added the arrays or how we added the objects was kind of interesting. So for example, I'm gonna show you the object thing. Um, where is it? Okay, so here it is. So the function for handling the objects is just a function that has a field. It, it could be a field. Um, I forgot the name. Well, a field group, something like a field group. I forgot the name <laughs> right now. Or we can have also details or that kind of um, elements. So if you see this, for example, the organization, which was an object, we have it as a as a details element here, a field set. Just remember it. It could also have been a field set. Um, so here we make the field set, and then we start calling again the got form element with the specific properties that the publisher has. So it is just a matter of getting deeper and deeper <laughs> levels of nesting but um, we can add the, the things. The, more trippy, the most tricky part here was actually with the arrays because we needed to be able to add more elements and remove the last element that was added. Um, so it was, it was kind of interesting. So in that case, for handling arrays, um, this is what I had to do. There's also something interesting here because we needed to handle simple arrays 
but also complex arrays. What are these, each of these things? The simple arrays are something like the categories. Like we have just one text field or number or whatever it is, but just we add items one by one. Okay, so we add one category and then we add another category and the category is just one property. Same thing with tags here. But what happens if what you have is an array of objects that is going to be a little bit different because you need to um, add each element and then call again the things to build the elements that are inside of that um, object. So building the arrays in general was a little bit more confusing um, because we needed to handle like the different deltas and the different keys um, because it is a multi-value thing. And yeah, so what we did for this was basically add some um, Ajax callbacks for each of the items. And we needed to um, have those callbacks somewhere that Drupal could see them. So I found out <laughs> this gave me a lot of headaches, but we found out that um, when we wanted to add a callback here, it didn't work. It wouldn't work. Actually, this one. They wouldn't work if they were inside of the form widget or of the custom widget class. I'm not really sure about why, but if you need to do that inside of um, your custom widget, the best thing you can do is to have the Ajax callback to be inside of your class but the submit callback to be outside of it. So I just had the submit callback to be in my .module file. And in here, I picked up the name of the item we were adding and check, check that against the triggering element to make sure we, we are adding the extra field to the right field. So for example, um, when I had category and tags, if I click on add one more tag, that we actually get the other item here. And not here, or not get them replaced. So in order to do that, um, I think this is a little bit confusing, but in order to do that, what I had to do was to set some values in the form state. For example, here, we were adding um, the elements and how many elements there were. So if we didn't have elements at the beginning because it is we're adding a new element, then we just put a value of one to be able to print one field. And if we already had more things, which is what we do in these other callbacks in the dot module, we increase the amount of items depending on what was the triggered element, triggering, triggering element. Um, then we bring that up here and build that amount of elements. So that was one of the confusing things. And the other um, was uh, actually processing the data. So in our case, we had all these fields and we needed all of them to be translated into one JSON. So it is then when I had to use the um, extract form extract form values, which is this this function here. And here we just needed to go over each of the items we had based on how we built it. And at the end, once we had the data uh, the data already built with the elements we needed, um, we will just translate that to JSON and then set the value to the items and then filter or, or remove the empty things. And finally set the element, set the values actually in, into the right place in a form state. So this was one of the most difficult things, but the extra extract form values is what actually let us um, process our data and, and flatten our data into what we really need to store it in the database. So I know this bit is um, a little bit confusing, but I'm confident that with that, 
um, new new items can can be done. This work is going to be well. It is open source, so um, I don't know if I put the link here, but here. This is where, where the module lives right now. It is part of the Deacon, but it will soon be something outside. So if somebody wants to contribute, you're, you're pretty welcome. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of work to do still, and we're open to contributions. So yeah, um, I'm not sure if there is questions about this. I know there is, but we're almost out of time. So. In case um, you want it, you can uh, ping me or talk to me in anywhere, <laughs> anyway, any place. Like I'm, I'm in Twitter or I'm also in Drupal.org, so you can tell me. I'm looking at a question. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. So Max is asking if, in my case, the data is still just getting saved to the database as a single text field. And yes, that's totally true. Um, it, it is still a single text field. So if you click save here or you go to view, what you will get is actually just um, once it loads, my computer is weird lately, you get all the JSON and it is just one single thing. So, um, I know Sean already put the link to it, but I will put here also the link to the to the module directly because it is in another branch. It is not yet in in master branch, but you can you can look at it there. Um, again, there are still some things that need to be fixed there. I'm still working on it, but all contrib all contributions are are welcome. And yeah, um, you can find me on on the Drupal Slack too, or in the webcam Slack as Darisa. I think nobody else is Darisa, so yeah. Um, you're into any page loading issues with the extra form elements for the larger the JSON is. Okay, so um, I think we haven't got into big issues because, but I think that's mainly because the items are pretty simple. I've noticed uh, it gets a little bit slower when we have the Ajax callbacks. Um, but yeah, I think that's like the only thing I will I will say is is making it slower. We call Yeah, it it will be a full country Drupal module um someday, hopefully soon. Um right now it is inside of the Deacon because we are we need some Deacon parts to make it work for example the the schema retriever but we're working on getting it out and and be something separated um so yeah um i think this is it so thank you so much for being here again keep in contact um i'm happy to talk every time and yeah thank you so much <laughs>